the defiant rebel, is dying a savior's death, arms flung wide like the crucified Christ. The stigmata appearing on his opened palm. There's something else that ties Goya's execution to Picasso's slaughter, something that turns the conventions of art on their head. And that's the alteration of light from good to evil. In everything ever written about art, everything ever done in painting, light is the bringer of beauty, of sublime dignity. Not here. Here, it's the instrument of slaughter, the sallow gleam in which the machine men go about their dirty business in the dead of night, just obeying orders. Now, look at Guernica. You feel the heave and swell of that pyramid of writhing bodies thrusting up through the painting, don't you? But what do they strain towards? An evil eye. And within that evil eye, the merciless glare of a single electric light bulb. It's the incandescence of the exterminating angel, the searchlight of the death squad and the targeting bomber, the bare bulb of the torturer's cell. Against it is the candlelight held straight out by a heroically beautiful arm. An epic battle then of the good and the wicked lights. Art versus evil. It's almost done, but there's one more necessary touch. He and Dora cover the body of the dying horse with a field of sharp little downward strokes that make the body dissolve into a sea of newsprint or the light of a newsreel projector. The marks are unreadable, though the visual equivalent of static. Towering above them is the force of art, breaking through the drone of news. When he's finished painting, he knows he's done the impossible, created something that reaches deep into modern nightmares, hectic, terrifying, burning, screaming. There's no way out. It's defiantly modern, but it also pulls us back into the tragedy of the ages. A cubist commotion, yet also a classical monument with its wailing women flanking the massive pyramid of death. It's just paint and canvas, but it has the authority of stone. It's unbombable. It's indestructible. For this picture achieves a miracle. Despite all the images of violence and disaster with which we're bombarded, it makes us feel it. It gets under our skin. This, for me, is what all great art has to do, crash into our lazy routines. The routine that Guernica tears into is a sickness of our, as well as Picasso's time. The habit of taking violent evil in our stride. The yawn at the massacre. Seen it before, go away. Don't spoil the fun of art. But Guernica isn't with us for fun. It's there to rip away the scar tissue, to make us bleed, to rob us of our sleep. So, 
What can art do when the bombs start dropping? It can instruct us on the obligations of being human. In all the ways that really counted, Picasso had won. Art had won. Humanity had won. So, does Guernica storm the Paris World Fair and the world of art? Well, no, not really. The response is devastatingly polite. Critics are more bemused than blown away. Left-wing visitors to the fair from Spain and beyond looked in vain for muscular proletarians in heroic attitudes. Or even the grim-faced bad guys in malevolent poses. One critic described the painting as nothing more than a private brainstorm, which, of course, it partly was. While Skernica is bathed in rather lukewarm praise, Picasso is off to the Côte d'Azur with Dora and his posse of friends. But there is now more to Picasso than the bohemian beach bum act. He is an artist transformed, an artist who believes his art has a political purpose and a political message. In Guernica and all my art, I express my revulsion of the military caste who have sunk Spain into a notion of pain. Two years after Guernica, Franco was victorious in Spain and fascism was eviscerating Europe. Guernica was not just a painting, it was a prophecy. In 1944, after four years of gruelling war, Paris was liberated from Nazi occupation and Picasso was free to meet an adoring public. And how they flocked to the studio, hungry for stories about Guernica's creation. He obliges the fans and groupies lingering on those years like an old field marshal reliving his finest campaign. Well, this was his finest campaign. Picasso once described the creative process as a kind of complete emptying. He'd put so much of everything he had to offer in the world into Guernica during those few feverish months of 1937 that afterwards, was not much left in the creative tank. He had 30 years of work ahead, the longest, saddest anticlimax in the history of art. Pablo Picasso becomes Comrade Picasso, the Cote d'Azur communist, knocking off hack work for the party of peace and goodwill. And what's worse than being a poster boy for Stalin? Well, just being a poster boy. Settling into celebrity, the Riviera tan ever deepening, Picasso leaps from the pages of Marxist critiques to the fashion glosses. In contrast, Guernica accumulates symbolic power. The painting takes up residence in New York City, where for three decades it burns with moral heat on the walls of the Museum of Modern Art. Its creator had done something no one who'd known him could ever have predicted. He'd rescued modern art 
from the curse of its own cleverness, from the curse of novelty. Guernica has always been bigger than art, uncontainable by mere museum walls. It's one of those very rare creations that gets into the bloodstream of the common culture. It's become the shared heritage of an appalled humanity and a mirror of the suffering of civilians in every conflict. In 1981, with Franco dead and democracy at last alive, Guernica found its way home to Spain. Picasso never saw its return, having died eight years before, but he relished the prospect that his painting would outlast Franco. Here's the old thing comfortably settled in Madrid. And just when you think, well, it's a magnificent relic, what can it possibly have to say to us in our video-saturated, digitally enhanced age? Something comes along to awaken from those old black and white characters the tempestuous force of their original creation. In February 2003, the American delegation to the United Nations decided to make its pessimistic case for the likelihood of armed intervention in Iraq. Colin Powell's presentation to the Security Council was to be followed by a press conference. And then, at the last minute, someone noticed something inconvenient about the location there was a tapestry reproduction of Guernica hanging on the wall. Oh dear, screaming women, burning houses, dead babies, jagged lines. Cover it up, said the TV people, it's too distracting. So Guernica was shrouded by a big blue drape. The news handlers could have said, hold on a minute, we could show the painting. After all, this is what tyrants do. Death, suffering, misery. But they didn't. However you massaged it, there was something about the way that damn picture would look on the news that would upset people. Much better to cover it up. It was, I suppose, the ultimate backhand compliment to the power of art. You're the mightiest country in the world. You can throw your armies around. You can get rid of dictators. But hey, don't tangle with a masterpiece.